And first we need to define a couple of parameters, obviously. Uh, number one, we want a will equal split Wilkinson with two output ports or input ports. Obviously the Wilkinson works both as splitter and combiner. We want our input and output impedance, which we call Z0 to be 50 ohms. And again, since the Pi filters here are supposed to act as a quarter wave equivalent, um, quarter wave stub equivalent, we need a frequency. And the frequency we're going to define here is, uh, let's pick 28 megahertz and uh, that's it. We don't worry about bandwidth or anything. That's supposed to be our center frequency and uh, that is going to be our uh, input and output impedance. Okay, now the first thing we calculate is R over here, the resistor, and I forgot to put R on there, but we can see it's a resistor. Americans may be confused because you're used to this uh, uh, more inductor-like looking thing. The uh, resistor is simply two times Z0, so that's simple. I'll write it out though for a moment here, so R equals two times Z0, and in our case, two times 50 is 100. So this resistor needs to be 100 ohms, very simple first object of our list. The uh, impedance or reactance of L needs to be equal to the square root of Z0. So it's, it's the square root of 2 times Z0. I apologize. So L, actually that's not correct, Z of L, let's put Z index L, needs to be what I just said, the square root of 2 times z0 and the square root of 2. My professor always made me learn all kinds of uh, roots and squares just simply to have them and the square root of 2 is a very important in math and uh, particularly in engineering. So it's 4.14 and uh, then we have 50 as our zo. So what comes out of this is 70.7 ohms for L. Now that's cool, but we need L and uh, that's the first value we need to determine L. So how do we calculate L? Um, the uh, formula that's usually given is totally in reverse. It's ZL equals it's omega times L. So omega is the frequency, but it's in a different unit than we're used to. This is in radians per second, but we want hertz. So uh, to get that, uh, this little omega here is, let's write this up here because we'll need this more often, 2 pi f. So 2 times pi times f. And uh, let's get the smart calculator here because I can't do that in my head. 2 times pi times 28 exponent 6. And that gives us... 1 point, let's round this up, let's say 1.76 times 10 to the power of 8. Uh, that should make sense. All right, very good. Okay, that's omega for us. But still, we can't calculate L with this formula. But rearranging this is really easy. We just divide both sides by omega. And if we do that, this cancels out. So our new formula here is, and I'll flip this around, it's going to be L equals Z index L divided by omega. So we know what our Z needs to be, and that needs to be the Z that we have previously calculated. And I'll write this on here, 70.7 ohms, and it's the same here, 70.7 ohms. So 70.7 uh, divided by, 1.76 times 10 to the power of 8 and uh, the result is four point zero one well let's forget about all this four times 10 to the power of negative seven all right let's write this out for a moment so it is four times 10 to the power of negative 7 Henry. Let's think about that for a moment. So that's how the calculator gives it to you and the calculator doesn't know what we want to do with it. 
but uh, we can move this virtual comma that's here over by two steps and get it to 10 to the power of negative 9. And if you ask why that's useful, that's easy because this here is nano Henry's or nano, you know, 10 to the power of negative 9 is nano. So uh, we now know that this is 400 nano Henry's. So this is for us to know what part to pick or what part to order. And this value up here is for our further calculations. I'll write that on here. So L needs to be 400 nano Henry or 400 times 10 to the power of negative 9. And if you don't like exponents, you hopefully will learn how to appreciate them in this little video because they make things so much easier if you use them. All right, so next step we need to calculate obviously C and the relationship once again of C, L and F is given in a normalized form F equals 1 over 2 times pi times the square root of L times C. Once again, normalized form and the reason why you get asked in almost any engineering interview how good your math skills are because it's really easy for engineers to look stuff up. That's very true. There's probably a book on almost anything and you can look up almost any formula. But usually you get it in a normalized form that 90% of the time will be useless in exactly that form. And if you need to spend three hours on rearranging a formula like this, you're going to have a hard time keeping up with other engineers. So let's rearrange this. We want to solve for C. So there's several ways you can do that. I'm going to simply start by uh, multiplying the whole thing by 2 pi. I'm probably taking too many steps, uh, but I'm doing this for a reason because now you're getting 2 pi f equals 1 over square root of LC. You see why I did this step because 2 pi f equals omega. We calculated omega. So we can simplify and say omega equals 1 over square root of LC. Now let's, uh, let's flip the 1 over part simply by taking the inverse of both sides. So that will give us 1 over omega equals square root of LC. And then we're going to square both sides. So this remains the same. We can simplify that. Uh, 1 over omega squared equals L times C. And this is really easy. We just take L out of there and divide this by L. So that gives us C. Now, again, having all the exponents ready and having all the stuff pre-calculated really makes our life super easy. So 1 divided by 1.76 exponent 8 the whole thing squared and uh, then divided by where did our L go? That was 400 nano Henry's, so uh, 400 exponent negative 9. And once again, the calculator gives the result in whatever makes sense for the calculator by some simple rules of uh, significant digits and things like that. And sometimes it is useful for us, sometimes not directly. But if you deal with exponents like that, it's easy to rearrange. Again, we're talking about capacitors here. So this result is in farads. And 10 to the power of negative 12 would be picofarads. So let's just shift the comma again. And uh, let's say uh, C equals 8.07. Now let's actually take this part out here completely. Uh, times 10 to the power of negative 11. If we rearrange that 80 times 10 to the power of 12, we know without further ado that this is 80 picofarads. There you go. So this over here is going to be 80 picofarads. By the way, the inductors all have the same value. So uh, 400 nano Henry's also here or with exponent 400 times 10 to the power of negative 9. Uh, capacitor up here, same value, 80 picofarads, and I know my handwriting is horrible, and don't worry about keeping track of all those formulas, they will be on my blog, so if you can't decipher what the heck I'm writing here, or uh, I'm going too fast, 
well, any of that, just uh, don't worry. It'll be on my blog. A little bit after I post this video, you will be able to just uh, look up the article, print it, and keep it wherever you might need it. So we have those C's, we have our L's, we have R, and uh, 2C is twice this, so 160 picofarads. However, when you're prototyping, let me just remind you that you can just add a second capacitor here. We just remove that to simplify and give both of those capacitors the value of C. That may be useful if you only have a certain, a certain value in stock or when you're prototyping, it may be easier just to uh, order a reel of one value as opposed to two. In a real production environment, you don't want to do that because your savings that you may get by buying a bigger reel of one part will definitely not offset the additional cost that you'll need to put that one extra capacitor into place. And capacitors are really junk cheap. So up here we need 160 uh, picofarads. Not Pico Henry's, Pico Ferrets. That's late. All right. There we go. So now we have calculated all the values we need. Our input impedance is 50 ohms. Our frequency we selected is 28 megahertz. Our resistor is 2 times Z0, it's 100 ohms. And uh, the capacitors turn out to be 80 Pico Ferrets. The inductor has 400 nanohandries, which translates to a reactance, an inductive reactance of 70.7 .7 ohms at this frequency. And that's really all there is to it. And now let's go take it to the bench. Let's build this Wilkinson splitter and let's see how it performs. Okay, here are the parts that we're going to use. I didn't have 80 picofarad capacitors, but I had 82 picofarads. That's okay. Normally you want the capacitors to be a little bit lower of what you calculated because there's always going to be a parasitic capacitance or not wanted capacitance in your circuit. But uh, we're going to play with this 82 picofarad setup. I have found one BNC terminal that I'm going to use as input. I didn't find enough to get one for each output. I have SMA connectors, but they don't work well with uh, this uh, copper clad board because they're designed to be flush mounted with a pre-printed uh, trace on there. So I'm just going to wing it and uh, hook up probes directly to the output and uh, make sure they're stable enough. I'll build this Manhattan style on, on this little piece of copper clad that I cut out real quick. And uh, well, the inductor is missing quite obviously. And here's the deal, I didn't have a 400 nano Henry uh, inductor. I got boxes full of inductors, but I just didn't find any with uh, 400 nano Henry, so anything close. But no problem, here's the solution. A couple of toroids and a uh, little bit of copper wire. So let's make our own. How does this work? Well. First of all, when you select a toroid, you need to make sure it covers the frequency range that uh, you want. Next, what you need to know is the factor of the inductance, and that's given as A index L. And uh, this type that I'm using here is a 50-6. This gives you an idea of the size, and 6 is the material used, very common. The other most commonly used is 2, and that's the red one. Our a index L equals 4 and the way you calculate the inductance out of this in microhenries, so L, I'll put that in parentheses, in microhenries equals AL times N squared. And that's obviously going to be your count of windings that you put through there. That whole thing divided by 1000 once again, uh, you will really appreciate if you're fluent in math, because now we have to rearrange the whole thing for n. So let's get started on this. Let's time the whole, things by one th uh, whole thing by 1,000. So 1,000 times our inductance that we want, and again, it's a microhenries, equals a index L times n squared. So we'll just divide the whole thing by a index L so we get 1,000 times the inductance divided by AL, A index L, equals N squared. So obviously we take the square root out of both sides, so we get the square root of 1,000 times our inductance in wanted inductance in microhenries, and that over 
a index l equals n. Now we don't need a calculator to really do that. This is supposed to be in microhenries, so uh, we want 400 nanohenries. That's 0.4 microhenries times 1,000 uh, gets us up to uh, 400. So microhenries in that case, if we multiply nanohenries by 1,000 divided by al. For this here, it's 4. So 400 divided by 4, very easy, is 100. And the square root of 100 equals 10. So that means n equals 10. We need 10 windings on this toroid. And I'm going to use this magnet wire here. All right, next thing. Very interesting and very practical. And many people don't think about this. They guesstimate how much wire they need to wind one of those toroids. Well, think about it. You know the height. You can find the height of this toroid in the data sheet. As a matter of fact, for uh, this type, it is somewhere around 4.8 millimeters. Now, the outer circumference of this toroid, you can calculate 2 times pi times your radius. So, your radius is going to be half the height, just a guesstimate. The height is 4.8, so 2.4 is going to be your radius. So 2 times pi times 2.4 equals 15, roundabout, and uh, that's 1.5 centimeters per winding. So you, we want 10 of those, so we need to put up about 15 centimeters of wire. We, will of course, want to add some leads, so if we cut off 20 centimeters of our wire, we will probably have a very lucky guess and don't need to waste too much wire. That was the quick and dirty version on uh, how to wind a toroidal inductor. If you want to see how you can do this a whole lot nicer, then uh, check out Ellen's uh, channel. It's W2AEW, Whiskey 2 Alpha Echo Whiskey. And he made a very nice video on how to wind toroidal inductors. And here's a little trick though. And uh, people sometimes ask me why I have na nail polish in my toolbox, and this is why. A uh, little bit of nail polish, especially on the uh, where, where the wire starts and ends, can really help the uh, mechanical stability uh, in your prototyping circuit. And I've always done that, just uh, put a little bit of nail polish over it. Only thing you have to make sure is that it doesn't stick to stuff afterwards. So I always just try to put it on the side and uh, not on the side. Well, depends from where you look. On this side, that side, and this side, and then put the toroid upside down on the desk, like I did over there. Like I said, just really most important on the where the wire goes in and where the wire comes out, like here. And I do quite a bit on the inside. And uh, there you go. That's it. I'm going to let this sit to dry for a moment. So this is the Wilkinson divider that we calculated for 28 megahertz uh, using 82 picofarad capacitors and inductors with 400 nanohenries. And uh, I'm feeding two signals into the uh, split ports. And remember, I've previously talked about this as a splitter. We know it also works as a combiner. And in this setup, I am using it as a combiner. 
I'm feeding a signal in here at 27.5 megahertz. Over here is another signal injected at 28.5 megahertz. Both signals have a level of zero dBm. So what we expect to see at the sum port is both signals with a slightly lower level. In an ideal world, just 3 dB lower, but reality doesn't work that way. So we expect to see something of, I wanna guess around, I don't know, three and a half, 4 dB, something like that lower. So uh, let's have a look what it really is. So here are the two signals, the 28.5 megahertz signal over here, 27.5 megahertz signal right here. This one shows 5.56 dBm, and uh, this one shows 4.91 dBm. So it's quite a bit higher than we expected. And we also see that the lower frequency signal is attenuated less than the higher frequency signal. And now remember, I already mentioned something earlier in the video. I mentioned parasitic capacitance, also known as stray capacitance. Uh, we can expect that our circuit probably performs at a much lower frequency than what we calculated it for, simply for capacitive and uh, inductive stray reactances being present in our circuit. So just as a guess, let's have a look at the circuit, how it operates just around 20 megahertz, and we'll figure out what the exact opera best operating frequency is for this in a moment, but right now let's just experiment. So let's put the center frequency at 20 megahertz. Let's leave the span and everything the way it is. And let me change my frequency. I'll put one signal at 20.5 megahertz and I'll put the other one at 19.5 megahertz. So what do we see now? 3.79 dBn and 3.58 dBm. That's a whole lot better, wonderful. Okay, great. So uh, the actual operating frequency is probably somewhere around 20 megahertz. And that's something you need to keep in mind. It worked very well as a combiner on 28 megahertz, the frequency we calculated it for, but it performs so much better on a lower frequency. And that's something you need to take into consideration. And if you use software that calculates this Wilkinson splitter, it will take this into consideration for you. And it's rather complex figuring out what stray reactances to expect. And uh, theoretically, you even need to consider your input and output impedance. We've only assumed a real input and output impedance of 50 ohms. But in reality, if you look at the setup right here, the wires are gonna have some sort of capacitance. So we do have some reactive parts to our input and output impedance. But now let's see if we can actually establish where the uh, best frequency is as far as our port-to-port uh, -port isolation is concerned. And we're going to use a very simple method for that. I'm going to terminate the output port with a 50 ohm dummy load. Then I'm going to inject a wideband noise signal in one of those ports and put the signal that comes out of the other port into our spectrum analyzer and where we get the highest insertion loss, so in other words, the lowest signal out, this is the point of highest isolation. And I'm really curious to see, number one, where that frequency is going to be, and second of all, how much isolation we can actually get out of this home build Wilkinson. Okay, that's the modified setup right here. We got a 50 ohm dummy load down here at our sum port. Then I'm feeding a noise signal into this port. It's a broadband noise. And I'm taking whatever comes out of here and putting it into the uh, Tektronix MDO 4000. So let's see what we get on the screen. So this curve right here shows the output from the second port and is pretty much representative of the insertion loss, which in this case is the same as our port to port isolation. And uh, we see the noise source is somewhere around negative 52 dBm. And it actually is fairly linear, at least over this bandwidth. There's not much bandwidth at all for the noise source that I'm using. And uh, we see right here, it is at negative 66 dBm. That's around 21 megahertz. So that's fairly close to the 20 megahertz that I guessed earlier. And uh, we get about 14 dB port to port isolation that is not nearly as good as what the mini circuit splitter had. But for a homebrew solution, that's not bad. 
Uh, it explains the basics of a Wilkinson, how to calculate it, how to select parts, and it made you aware of the fact that there is parasitic or stray reactants involved that you need to consider. So in reality, like I said, there's two ways. If you have access to software that just calculates these things for you, the software will consider these parameters based on your PCB material and uh, inputs that you can put in from um, parts data sheets and, and other sources. And if you have to do this by hand, it's a little bit of guesswork, but that's why prototyping is so important. That's why you build a couple of batches with different values and see what you get. But we're not going to get into that. This video is already way too long. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope this helps you if you are faced with the challenge of designing a Wilkinson divider. And again, this is an equal split Wilkinson with two output or input ports, depending on how you want to look at it. And if you liked it, please give me a big thumbs up, share this video with the world, and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. See you next time.